Welcome this morning, guys. I uh, really appreciate everyone joining us who's with us this morning. Uh, excited to have uh, a talk this morning with myself. I'm, I'm Jordan Mariello, SVP of Managed Services. Um, this morning, I have Richard Diver. I'll let him introduce himself as well. Hey, I'm Richard Diver. I work at Microsoft as a technical business development manager, helping partners um, learn and bring all of our security and capabilities to, to, uh, to our customers. So thank you for inviting me today. Looking forward to it. Okay, so it's like carry, I'll carry on with the slides and, and hopefully this is all working well and everyone can hear us okay. The current landscape. I'm going to explain just a few of the things that we see changing and uh, some of the things you can do in your environment to uh, to hopefully put yourselves in a better stance for the uh, to defend against attacks and just make sure that you're able to meet compliance and regulation requirements as needed. Um, so in this diagram, what I want to show is that uh, really the focus should be around the actual analysts and threat hunters themselves and to ensure that they've got the tools they need to uh, get the job done in the most effective way possible. So at Microsoft, we've uh, done this internally uh, extensively, and we have these two metrics that are really useful to get, refer back to is how responsive can you be, so the mean time to acknowledgement, and then how effective is your remediation, so how long would it take you to remediate from the various different um, threat scenarios. So in that, what we look at then is, um, what do you have today? So one of the suggestions is to take a look at your current environment. And if I was, I've been an architect for 20, or I've been in IT for 20 years, I've been architecting for the last maybe 10 years of that career time. And in that time, what I would do is just spend my time making sure that um, you did a regular catalog and inventory of everything you, you have got in the environment, especially new things coming all the time. Um, maybe you're new to the company or you've been there 10 years or more. It's always worth looking at what do I have in say each one of these boxes. So my endpoint, protections, information protection, identity is a huge area. Uh, we can never do enough to strengthen identity. And a lot of effort is put around network and security and then infrastructure and applications. But take a look at all of that and see how much of that is going into something like my SIM. Do I have a SIM? Am I large enough and complex enough to need a SIM? And if I do, what am I using today? And a lot of that comes back to how much budget do I have as well? Um, and what kind of threats uh, are most prevalent? Is it my on-premises estate? Is it my mobile devices? Um, you know, where where do I think my worst threats could be? And honestly, it's, it's also where you're not thinking they are, but let's cover all bases uh, as best you can. The next area to look at is what Microsoft has now is called um, uh, XDR platform, so extended detection and response. There's two sides to this. On the left side, you'll see Azure Defender. This is everything protecting networks and services and uh, servers and virtual machines, containers, databases, anything on the infrastructure side that will come under Azure Defender, whether that's cloud or on-premises. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see Microsoft 365 Defender. If you've ever heard of E3 or E5, this is generally what we're talking about is the E5 suite of advanced security and uh, compliance capabilities that we offer now. So with those capabilities, what we're looking at is if you have them, great. You should absolutely deploy all of them and make the most use of them. If you don't have them, maybe you're considering consolidation or you're looking at um, adding to any gaps you might find in your portfolio. And over time, things are always replaced and upgraded as new capabilities come across anyway. So at some point, these, these may or may not come into your purview, hopefully at least one of them, but they work better together when it's a full suite. Um, and we have plenty of partners. You can see all these logos on this page today are literally partners of Microsoft as well. So it's not about having a pure 100% Microsoft uh, state, but there is a lot more security tools today than you might be aware of that we'd like you to take a look at and understand in more depth. And again, always important point is not more tools. I uh, hate to just buy more tools and say, I've, I've bought them. That's great. It's deploying them and making the most of them. And that's probably the hardest part of all of it is it's easy to go buy the tool but actually getting it to work um, properly and integrated in your environment, working for the way that your company and your business works is probably the harder part. And sometimes that requires um, a lot of dedicated research and study. And other times it's bringing in a third party to help you do that, bring in the consultants, get the job done, um, maybe faster with it because they have the expertise um, or at least have a roadmap of how you're going to get the stuff deployed in the next one, two and three months. Don't wait six months, one year, two years. You know, it's too late by then. The next area to look at that we always recommend is um, SOAR, so um, security orchestration and automation remediation. The uh, point there is with all these different tools, the, the suited tools together in bundles versus, and also those tools from other products, how do you get them all to work with each other? So if a problem is identified on the endpoint, how do we make sure that same details are handed back 
generally where the SIM steps in, but how do we make sure that those details are generally handed back into a central knowledge base so that we can um, act on them in all of our states? So then firewall servers know to block the IP address or the identity system knows to look for those identities and see what they're doing in cloud app securities. All of that leads to the fact that we need a SIM that is maybe cloud-based. Um, one of my favorite topics is Azure Sentinel. And to understand what Azure Sentinel can do for you, um, it's really looking at some of the latest and greatest videos. And uh, I present a lot of diagrams regularly to explain that Azure Sentinel isn't just another SIM. It's a whole new way of looking at how do I do centralized log management and alerting and monitoring like a SIM does today, but on top of that, adding in a lot more features and functionality um, at a price that is really um, free to get started and goes up as you use it. So anybody can get started with this product. They can uh, ingest data at a very low cost initially, free to, to, no, to nothing to, to you know a few dollars. Um, and then as you start to find use for it and you start to put more data into it, so you start adding your network devices, your endpoints, your servers, the more data that goes in there, then yes, the price does obviously increase, but it's because you're using it and getting use out of it. And if you don't want to use it, you turn it back off again. That's what I like about um, cloud services is if you don't like them, you turn them off and you stop paying for them. Um, so with a SIM in the way and we have the XDR platform and then we have all the um, other endpoint solutions for each individual specific problem, we're now looking at a full security architecture. And with all of this in place, um, whether you have it in place or you're working on it, you're building it, at some point you'll have either some or all of this in your environment as a security architect. So then it comes to how do I operate all of this? And if I have more than one person, I now need a team of people to operate it. And how do we make sure they all work well together and that they are um, constantly looking for the latest threats? So on this side, what we offer is at Microsoft, we have something called the Microsoft Threat Experts. This is a group of people that um, are actually looking at threats that daily, uh, every every minute of every hour of every day, trying to protect Microsoft 365, Azure, Xbox, uh, everything that Microsoft does. This team is helping to protect that. And what they can do is add some of that knowledge and value out to our customers and bring that into um, things like Defender for Endpoint. So if you see a specific attack type happening inside of your environment, or maybe you didn't see it because the alerts told you it was a low or medium risk potentially, our threat experts will actually um, elevate those alerts up and tell you that they are. This is one to look at. This isn't one to ignore. You need to jump on this immediately. And if you need help, you can call out to those experts and they'll actually help you out and investigate the problem as well. Now, that's a very specific service. It's not a 24-7 monitoring service. They're not there as your um, outsourced partner. That's there as a very pure um, uh, specific service that's going to help you threat hunt at a very deep level, um, backing up your own threat hunters. This is when the managed detection response partner like Critical Start comes in, is that there are certain things that your team is going to be really good at doing, and there are going to be other things that you should just let go and let another company help you out with. And that's where our partners are really key and useful in helping customers to get this done at scale. So Defender for Endpoint is one of the um, main products that most companies have, are looking at and deploying. It's one of the top in the Gartner Quadrant, which we love. Um, but there is a lot of work to be done to keep it going and keep it running and to um, monitor the threats and alerts coming in, tune the system, and then respond to them. So what I look for is teams that can hand that kind of work out to a partner, and then the, your team can then actually spend their time focusing on all this other um, security pieces of the of the architecture here. So that's it, all kind of in one picture. Um, from here, we can talk about lots of other avenues about where this is, where it's important, where we see um, value, where we see costs jumping up, um, how you can improve your own architectures and where you can look for improvements. Um, so yeah, so I will hand on to Jordan to take us through the next couple of slides. Um, as Richard was saying, you know, Richard has a, a tremendous amount of experience doing this kind of architecture work and consulting work for this, um, working 20 years in this, and, and myself too as well, um, having spent uh, 20 years specifically in just cybersecurity and a lot of that time in security operations and doing STEM, STEM work and consulting. Um, and this is kind of the area of focus. So what we wanted to do was have a conversation about how to maximize the capabilities that you have right now, not just talk about you know, what new technologies are out there, but a lot of the questions that we often get is how do we use our current tools um, or even how do we get started on this journey um, when we're talking about stock capabilities and tools. And so as we enter into this, this will kind of be conversation starters and points that we'll talk about with, my, with Richard and myself that we kind of share some of the experience and the, maybe some of the wisdom that we've gained 
um, over the years here. Um, so one of the things that I often talk about um, when, when we get in this topic is, is kind of uh, all data, good data, and the right data. Um, a lot of times what we see is we get into engagements with security operations, and obviously the conversation begins to revolve around SIM as a data centralization and analytics mechanism, um, is that we start asking questions about well, what should be in there. Um, and unfortunately, what a lot of times happens is we start the SIM engagement with scoping the entire environment. You know, what is everything that you have, all the firewalls, every component, every system, all your application logs, what's the size of all of that, and put that all in step. And the reality is, is, is that we should be actually looking at this um, more from a use case focus, right? We should scope deployments based on use cases that actually matter for your enterprise. But the value of data that needs to be uploaded should absolutely align with the expenditure that you're putting into STEM. So you want to start with the end in mind. Start with asking, hey, what use cases are the most important for me to solve from a SOC perspective, from a security operations perspective right now? Um, as a business, what are the risks that we face and what are the data sources that we have um, and how can I attack some of those risks? Um, and, and not every use case applies to every environment or, or should apply to every environment. And so it's not necessary that, that necessarily every single data type and every single data point from an environment should always be brought into SIM or be retained for the long term. Because as we know, right, it, generally speaking, data is, is going to be priced by consumption. So we want to make sure that the value matches the cost that we're going to spend to have it in there. Um, the other thing that's really important to consider in this is, is data authority, right? Are, are we bringing in question generating data versus question answering data? Right? And this is a key component as you build out security operations, because there's a lot of data that will generate the kind of alerts that make questions for the security operations team. Right? You have an IPS alert, you have a firewall alert for um, uh, specifically, like, let's say, command and control um, outbound from a system on your network. Well, that generates a bunch of questions that you're going to need other types of data to answer. Right? You're going to want to know, okay, well, um, you know, what binary, what executable, executable was bound to that port? And, how did that file get on there? And what permissions is it running with it? You want to be asking yourself, okay, do I have with these use cases the appropriate aligning data to answer the questions that are being generated? And what is the data authority, right? And so there's different authoritative sources for different types of data. If you're looking at monitoring endpoints, the authoritative source is often, often going to be the endpoint data in and of itself, like pulling data from Defender for endpoints. Um, if you're monitoring user activity, well, the authoritative source is obviously Active Directory or single sign-on for that. Right? And so you want to make sure that you're looking at places where the verbosity and the data authority um, matches your ability to answer questions and resolve alerts and investigations, and that you're getting the appropriate question answering data for any question generating data that you also bring in. To, to kind of highlight that a little bit, um, you know, this is, this is maybe an extreme scenario, but outlines cases that we see a lot when we go into STEM deployments, and specifically for us, MDR deployments, is that we go in and, and we start talking about what is the STEM license and what is the MDR deployment and what are we going to be monitoring, and we start looking at, okay, well, there's this one terabyte STEM license to accomplish 80 use cases, and we start looking at the value of the data that's in there and, and you know, how much of it is duplication of data that exists in other places, how much of it is authoritative, how much will answer questions for investigation. And very, very often we can see dramatic reduction in SIM licensing, um, but accomplishing the same number of use cases by simply drilling into what use cases want to be solved first and what data sources can we use to solve those. And although we might be able to see the same thing you know, from, a, you know, WAF and the same thing from firewall or the same thing from like a, a net scalar device, we can decide, well, with these two sources over here combined, we can see everything we need to see to solve this use case, answer all the questions. We don't necessarily need that third source um, from a use case perspective. Maybe you have a compliance need for it and that's different, but when you let use cases drive it, you'll have a little bit different logic about how you approach, how you look at, how you scope, and, and even how you scale your SIM deployment long term. Oh, Richard, I'm sure you have some expertise on this topic, especially as it applies to some of the Microsoft sources here as well. 
Yeah, what I've seen actually is when a customer has a, some, like you say here, a one terabyte SIM license or a 300 gigabyte SIM license, these are normally the maximums that they are going to go to. And one of the great things about, and this, we're not talking only about a product here like Azure Sentinel, but one of the good things about cloud technologies and Azure Sentinel is that um, it scales up and down. So what we find actually as a, a one terabyte SIM license, the average per month usage is more like six or 700 gigabytes. So that difference really in the amount you would pay, even if it was a like for like price, you'd only be using an average of 700 gigabytes per month instead of a one terabyte maximum that you have to pay for. So this is why we see more and more uh, of our customers looking and just considering um, what, where can I save money in one place so I can spend more in another. It's not like you're going to um, hopefully not reduce your uh, security budget too much, but any money that you can shave off in one area um, means that the, you can either add more use cases, you can start to add more technologies to solve for some of those use cases, or even better, get more people to help you out as well. So I think I clicked next slide accidentally for you. <laughs> And, and I completely agree. I think this is one of the keys when we look at, you know, what is truly modern SIM right now, tools like Azure Sentinel versus kind of the traditional SIM platforms that are really governed by strict licensing protocols around um, consumption um, and, and aren't really presenting, you know, a, an opportunity for the customer, for the user to look at things like averages, whereas, you know, you're getting that with a cloud-based platform now. I mean, we have some customers, and especially for us when we look at some of our financial services customer base, where 60 to 70 percent of the transaction data from that is happening during normal working hours, right? And, and then another 25 percent is happening just in extended working hours. But then when we get to the time period of like 10 to 4, you know, in the evening, 10 to 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., the traffic is, is less than 10 percent of the total volume. So they might peak at what looks like, you know, um, you know, a terabyte size. But if you average that out across, where you really end up looking at something that is more like, like you said, like 600 and 700 gigabytes, and that becomes a tremendous advantage when we're looking at tools like Azure Sentinel and modern SAM cloud-based platforms that can scale up and down versus the traditional, you know, I won't call it anything, but traditional on-prem deployment where you're sizing, you know, a, a processing across clusters and um, compute and, and your storage right. is signed very, very specifically to get the I.O. that you need coming in and out. And, then and, you're, and you're trying to scale for the next five years as well. You're trying to consider how much am I going to need in two, three years time and five years time to make the most of the, the investment. Whereas again, cloud allows you to, to cater for any um, sudden changes in the business. So another area is things like retail this time of year um, and sometimes you know the summer or winter, depending on the different seasons, um, different retail and uh, I've seen sporting teams as well, will change their volume and usage and uh, how busy they might be in the security team uh, to react and respond to different events that are happening across the company. So yeah, another great way to make sure that you're uh, being as agile as you can be when it comes to volume of security alerts. Yeah, and, and so you're looking at day-to-day -day peaks and then you're also looking at seasonality peaks where maybe your expenditure is up, right, in the holiday season for a retail organization, right? But then as you come into, you know, late spring and summer, it's down dramatically and, and you want to be paying for the usage you have, but you want the system to still perform consistently. And so instead of doing this massive on-prem deployment with flash drives to get I.O. That, that can deal with just the peak that happens in November, December, the system simply handles that scaling on the back end of its own. And, and these are real keys to success to bear in mind. And some of the things that when we look at, you know, where we were from a, a, a STEM perspective, even five years ago in our industry, that has changed dramatically and that we have to adapt our mindsets to, um, even as security practitioners today and, and how we look at, you know, pricing and budgeting and, you know, how much do we put in the STEM versus how much do we put on the technology that feeds in the STEM? And can we properly balance that budget by having the right scalable systems at the back end? So one of the other things I wanted to touch base on um, is, is training to your tools and training to the threat. Um, my, myself, I, I happen to be um, a veteran in the US military. And, and one of the things I learned in that service is what value good training is um, to actual operations when under stress. And um, one of the things that the military does incredibly well um, is perform things that you guys see exercises and war games. A lot of times they make the news wherever you're from. Um, and, and you see those kinds of things where entire fleets of the Navy go out and do exercises. And um, those things actually build very, very valuable skills because 
they're training to whatever the current threat is that they may face, and they're using the tools they're going to use when they're potentially facing that threat. This is still an absolute key, even when it comes down all the way to the stock analyst or the day-to-day -day security practitioner, is that training is still a key for quality investigation and analysis work. Right? Now, generalized training is great, and, and I do think you need to have it. There are great courses out there that people should consider doing and should make staples that they accomplish, like CISSP or um, you know, the, the, the uh, Cybersecurity Analyst Plus and other things like that are very valuable. Um, some of the more advanced ones like OSCP and Offensive Security Certification are all great, and they build a, a tremendous amount of knowledge and technical skill. Um, but when we look at getting to the objective of being able to perform the day-to-day -day task responding instance, we want to make sure that we're actually training with the tools that we have, that we're practicing using Defender uh, for Endpoint and going to the right consoles and um, pulling in the data and testing that and, and running drills um, in our actual environments. And I think this is something that is often overlooked. And a lot of the security operations, a lot of the maturity assessment work that we do, we go in and we find people just simply don't spend a lot of time doing tabletops and drills and exercises, right? Because you need to be checking, is, is your process working as expected? Um, do you know the technology as well as you think you do? If, if you end up needing to download a file from your endpoint agent or um, isolate an endpoint, are, are you sure that you know exactly where to go to do that and do that in a timely fashion? And one of the other most important things that happens is this will instill confidence in the teams that are actually performing this activity. So that when you have real threat activity, you have real breach activity in your network, your team is going to be confident that they know how to do it. People aren't going to panic. Um, a, a great quote in regards to this from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, he said in one of his books on, on training for war, stress, stress is directly proportional to preparedness. Right? And this means that, you know, however well we have prepared and trained for a particular situation um, is, is going to directly impact how stressed we are when that situation actually occurs. And, and even more so, how well will we handle it? How good will the decisions we make be? And will we perform up to our expectations? Uh, Richard, I'm sure you probably have some comments in your experience on this one too. Yeah, I think it's always nice to think about having spare time, isn't it? But no one gets to the end of their to-do list. There's always the next thing to do. But um, uh, a great way of putting it is hack yourself first, at least with a mindset of understanding that um, don't expect it's not going to happen. It's much better to take the stance of it probably is or will happen at some point. So what am I going to do about it? I think that's the whole point of use case scenarios is go back and review those 80 plus use cases you might have and go, well, is, which ones of these are... Um, not only most likely to happen, but which ones would give me the worst day ever? <laughs> and let's go work on that because that's really what uh, you should be spending our day to day doing is not looking through logs and trying to research and hunt and investigate. You know, that has to be done, but we want to do it quickly and get it out of the way so we can go back to defending. Um, if we're constantly responding to alerts in the system and trying to hunt down loose ends, uh, which may come to no avail, then we haven't spent that valuable time we could have been spending on shoring up the defenses at the same time. So it's a balance of both. But yeah, got to be prepared. I completely agree. And, and I think those specific scenarios are really important, like you said. You want, you want to pick the things we talked about, starting with the end in mind, and we were talking about use cases. Well, you also want to go back to that when you're looking at planning out your training for your teams and saying, what are the real scenarios we care about? What are the big risks? And let's train to those big risks. Let, let's train with protecting the crown jewels in mind. Let's, let's train with the breach of the most sensitive data in mind and go through and run those scenarios. Start with tabletops and then, you know, from there go to, you know, uh, mock-up scenarios. And then from there, you know, if you have the time and, and you are mature enough, then that's where you move into things like red team exercises or, or purple team where you're working together as, you know, a lot of the new terms are coming out like that. But these are incredibly important. Right, investing in the human as well as just buying more technologies. Right, as much as I, we love to uh, spend money on buying things, it's the people that really make the difference at the end of the day. I absolutely agree. Right? And and when it comes down to it, right, they, you can go into we go in a lot of organizations and we're looking at this this kind of thing, and you know they're they're asking for help in these kinds of things, and they go in and and the question often is, well, what technology do I need to solve that problem? And a lot of times. You know, the answer is, well, you already have all the technology you need to solve that problem. <laughs> what yeah. we really need to do is, is mature a few processes around it, really train you guys on how to maximize this technology. And I'm sure you see that a lot even, in, you know, from your portfolio perspective, Richard. 
I've seen customers with um, three different CASB solutions and still looking to buy another one because they either didn't realize they had them or they didn't think the one they had was good enough and wanted to buy, again, whatever, the car in the top right-hand corner. Let's go buy the next one. And say so if you don't use what you already have to, the, to its most uh, strengths and capabilities, then buying another one isn't going to make it any better every time. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and this is where I really see that coming into play too. When you talk about going in and testing the technologies or running tabletops and drills, right? This will really test that how well is that technology deployed? Are you seeing the things you expect to see? Is it working the way you expect it to work? Um, does it provide you, you know, the response capabilities that you need, the data that you need to answer questions? Um, are you able to report up with confidence afterwards how you handled the exercise and, and, and more importantly, how you think you would do in the real world scenario? when it happens. And, and I think that's an important mechanism is, you know, when you're looking at this technology, it's like you said, you, you have more than one CASB solution and, and somebody's looking at buying another. And the question is, well, you know, how well can you possibly use one? Well, let's actually test that. Let's see, let's run some scenarios. Let's, let's put a test machine on the network and let it do some activity that should be detected. Let's see how it detects and let's see how we respond to it. And, and these types of drills are incredibly important to prepare that the key element, like Richard said, the people for this. So the, the obvious next part of this that we often get is um, the, the questions around, okay, well, well, what if we're not prepared to um, actually do some of these things on our own? I mean, we want assistance in providing, you know, whether it's from the beginning where we talked about, you know, that kind of 24-7 monitoring, you need the augmentation, um, you need the additional support on the back end, you, you need people who are looking 24-7 because you're not able to staff that yourself, or whether we're looking at the services side of um, the, the process maturity. Um, and looking to do tabletop exercises and testing and making sure that your people and your process are solid and shored up. And I think this is where there's, you know, partnership available to really assist here. As Richard talked about the tremendous expertise that, that exists in Microsoft with your threat experts and the things that are there to help you. Right? And then augmenting that with organizations like we have a Critical Start, where we're around the edge of that, providing the NDR services, the 24-7 monitoring, but also coming in and really helping to work and not just say, hey, let's buy a technology, but hey, how do we improve our process? How do we improve our capabilities with the technologies we currently have? How do we ensure that we're ready for when the real world scenario happens? And I, and I do think when those questions ask, um, or when you're asking questions about how do I properly scope and choose use cases, identify the right risk for my business, if you're not comfortable for, with those kinds of things, leverage your partners and leverage the outside expertise that does exist out there. It's just incredibly important. Yeah, it's uh, it's certainly hard to um, get a whole SOC team together in the first place, right? As I'm sure you know about just hiring and recruiting them, let alone maintaining and keeping them. So whether the customer decides that they're going to um, build their own or, or buy their own, there's always a need even for a full SOC team to have someone to call out, call a friend, right? At some point, your team either is at max capacity with the number of investigations you have or um, holidays, sickness. We're in a time period now where for the last nine months, we don't know what that's like, but, um, having different people come and go and being available or not available. So having the ability to call out and uh, lean on a partner, either in times of need or hopefully more proactively and long-term to either keep training that team up, training new people up, um, augment them or, or potentially replace the team. Um, again, it, uh, as the years go by, every, com every company I've worked at has had different needs uh, come and go. So sometimes you have a full stack, 10, 15 people in a team, and other times you've got two, one, two people that have to try to do it all. Um, and no matter what size you are, you know, again, when one of these problems hits, uh, everybody's out of action for either hours, days, or sometimes weeks as they carry out the investigations and try to um, get back to normal. Yeah, and, and you know, I've, I've had the, the privilege of being able to go through two, you know, enterprise stock build outs, one as a service provider and, and one on the customer side myself at a uh, financial services organization. Um, and the, the one thing I can say is that that, that resource, you know, that finding, um, training, retaining the talent in the stock is a significant challenge. And then you want to make sure that that you are prepared for that, that you do have the augmentation you need, um, you know, that that you think through the the problems of 24/7 coverage and overlap, and you know, making sure the analysts actually do get to eat and go to the bathroom because even they need to do that sometimes. Um, but that, those kinds of challenges are are significant in managing risk for a lot of organizations when we're talking about maximizing the tools. 
so much of it comes up to people availability training and then where you need to augmenting with appropriate services and and that's where we're here to provide guidance and support and not just to say hey you need mdr services or hey you need to buy this technology but to help look at it and say hey you know what you really need is some process improvement and let us help you know with the, the, with the maturity assessment and figuring out where you are and where you need to go and uh, richard i know you're a big believer in, in maturity assessments of this kind of work too yeah, I like uh, the idea of continuous. Uh, nothing's a one-time done. Right? No one's going to come in and say it's fixed. We've done, we've nailed it. We've done security, and, and we can go to sleep now. Um, it's un unfortunately one of those things that is just going to be continuous and uh, keep a lot of people employed for a long time, which is great. But at the same time, a lot of people stressed for a long time if they don't feel they at least have some level of comfort that they've you've done everything you possibly can to prevent the worst day ever, and you've prepared for when it does happen. Um, you know, then it's just like anything we have firefighters and we have um, paramedics and we have all the people ready to respond when things go wrong but at the same time we put safety rails and seat belts and airbags and cars to make sure that um, the impact is lessened and in security and, and IT security cyber security cloud security they're all uh, have different levels of guardrails and airbags that we have to deploy as well as be ready to respond when when it happens so no scare stories here but you know we've both had our fair share of having to respond and that's not a fun day for anybody yeah, it's definitely not. And you want to be prepared for it. You want to make sure your people are prepared for it. And, and you know, even when we talk about doing both, you know, the maturity assessment, the continuous assessment, doing the tabletop, the war game exercises and things like that, you even want to make sure that your senior executive staff is prepared for it and involve and engage them in these kinds of exercises too as well. Report up to them on the exercise, um, involve them in the reporting data, make sure that you're reporting the kinds of things that they want to see and hear to give them the confidence, the assurity they need that you've got it handled too as well. Because like we said, nobody wants to be in that situation. Nobody wants that to happen, you know, God forbid, but it does occur. And, and if and when it does, you want to make sure that you're working processes that you've vetted, tested, worked through, assessed, and it's not the first time that you're ever running those. You don't want to be answering questions about whether your processes work on the day where you have a real breach, you want to be answering questions about what actually happened with the incident. And sometimes the response uh, can make it worse. Right? Um, so even at Microsoft, we have uh, our CEO, Satya Nadella, once a year attends an in-person active um, uh, test environment to make sure that he understands what to do and respond to. You know, and a lot of that is the media. Um, you, you don't know where the, the attack may have happened days, weeks, or months ago, and now you find out about it. So the response is, how quickly do you gather the information? How accurate are you? And then what are you going to choose to release publicly versus not release? And all those decisions are outside of the technical team. You know, the security team that they're doing the day job is not the team that's going to respond to the press generally. Um, so if you don't involve uh, everybody that's in the key stakeholders across the entire organization, um, not only from don't let them get fished in the first place and become the cause, but also don't let them make the problem worse by either downplaying it when it actually is serious or um, just for saying the wrong thing. You know, tweeting something out can can be terrible as just as well as not saying anything at all when it's asked official questions. So um, it, again, it's just another element of uh, can't just buy technology and solutions to solve all these problems. You've got to do the whole end to end story, which is why we call it architecture. It's um, it's more than just the front door and the back door and the windows. You completely agree, right? You, you want to test that end to end, you know, the executive staff, the PR team and what you report and when you report it and all those things are all incredibly important as a part of this process. Well, we are coming up on the 40 minute mark here where we've been um, talking and, and going over our points and we'd love to get some questions from the audience here um, that, that we can help answer for you guys. Um, if we have any questions coming in, please feel free to go ahead and send them across and we'll be happy to answer them, provide you guys any additional context and any of the things we've talked about um, or, or drill into any particular topic with more detail. Yeah, it's always interesting to hear what the latest challenges are, either technology challenges, people challenges, security landscape. I always like to hear you know, where people are, where are people getting their information from? Um, how do you keep up on what the latest is and what's relevant to you as well? I think um, one of the areas, while we're waiting for some questions, to come in, one of the areas to look into is things like threat intelligence. Um, you know, where do you get your threat intelligence from and how do you know that it's curated to your needs? There's a lot of information out there. A lot of it may not be relevant to your, either your geography or your um, business sector. And at the same time, on the other side of that, and uh, 
there's some really good websites out there. Maybe we can we can share them afterwards. Um, you know, feel free to to contact us and get in touch with us via LinkedIn or however you found out about this this webinar. We'll tell you some good sources to go to. But uh, don't think it's not going to happen to you <laughs> just because it sounds like it's uh, far fetched or um, you know it only happens to the big players or people that are important. A lot of the smaller companies are getting hit by simple and easy tasks like uh, malware, uh, encrypting all your disks, and uh, just giving you a bad bad day or bad week. Um, uh, but even uh, the most benign, uh, simplest of attacks can lead to something much larger. So understanding the threat intelligence means that you can understand what is in your environment most likely going to happen um, should the series of events happen. And it's generally not just one, it's, it's a multitude. So yeah, I'd encourage you to reach out, um, get in touch with us, uh, at least have an assessment, find out where you're at in the state of play. You know, What is your maturity level today? Where would you like to get to next? engage a partner, talk about, uh, you know, talk about these concerns and, and let's work out if we can either save you some money on some technologies that you may have invested in the past um, or if you have some gaps where you haven't invested on the technology side and then what can we do to help the people out? Because again, the people are the ones that, that will make or break it at the end of the day, no matter what technology you buy. So yeah, really good to talk to everyone today and I uh, look forward to doing it again in the future. Uh, excellent. Uh, love talking with you, Richard. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate uh, your attendance. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, um, please feel free um, to reach out to uh, info at criticalstart.com. We'll be happy to um, help guide you guys to any of the answers that are needed and getting you the data that uh, you needed. Um, also, bear in mind, we have an upcoming webinar uh, where Richard will also be online with our CTO, Randy Watkins. He'll be talking about uh, Endpoint Security Simplified. Um, and, and definitely focusing a little bit on uh, def, uh, Defender for Endpoint there too as well, um, as that's a technology that we use quite a bit here um, in our managed services um, and are big believers in uh, the value of that technology too as well. So it'll be a great talk. Randy is, is fantastic as a yes. researcher. Yes, looking forward um, to that. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. you. We'll really enjoy that conversation. Excellent. All right, have a great day.